dance from around the world. An animated opportunity. A visit to a fabulous new Aldo Moroni installation. And of course, drama. Coming up on <laughs> Artifacts. We'll tell you more in just a few seconds. Greetings, everyone. From the Minneapolis Community Development Agency, I'm Phil Lindsay. And from the Office of Film, Video, and Recording for the City of Minneapolis, I'm Janet Zahn. Well, I know this is hard to believe, but we are now turning the corner on a new season. And you can really feel things start to bubble out in the arts community. Yes, it's the season for season openers. And Phil's first guest will be here to tell you about one of them, the Northrop Dance Series. Yes, I'll be talking with Dale Schatzline, who's got lots of exciting news and some great video from three of the dance companies that will be performing at Northrop this fall. Then our crack Artifacts Video Squad will bring you a look at the beautiful new Aldo Moroni sculpture recently installed in the new Federal Reserve Building in downtown Minneapolis. Then it's on to that animated opportunity. Mm -hmm. For the first time in eight years, the Minnesota Electronic Theater is going to be a juried show. You'll find out why and how you can enter, and you'll meet several folks who will be here to tell you about this stunning display of digital wizardry, including Don Bages, mm -hmm. a true original on the Twin Cities animation yeah, scene. Yeah, that's going to be nice. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the drama. Stuart Rosen and Amy Parks from Ice Age Theater will join me for a preview of their show, Crossbones, which is opening at the Theater Garage on October 17th. And don't forget the infamous artifacts giveaway this month. It's an opportunity to show how with it you really are with this charming and sophisticated hat from the Minnesota Film Board. You can win this fabulous prize simply by being the seventh caller to our City Cable 34 hotline. That's 673 2 Two, three, four. Now your address and phone number are necessary. Leave those on our answering machine. Tell us you're watching Artifacts. And who knows, you could be the grand proud owner of this <laughs> hat and the envy of everyone in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And now, on with the show. Dale Schatzline, director of the Northrop Auditorium, will be here right after this clip from the Cloud Gate Dance Theater, one of the companies performing in the Twin Cities this fall as part of the Northrop Dance Series. Stay tuned. <laughs> Well, that was just a few moments, uh, a look at uh, the Cloudgate Dance Theater, which when I saw the clip earlier, I was amazed. I'm planning on going to see that. It, it looks very dramatic. I like the visual elements. And I think I misled you when we led into that. That's coming in uh, February, am I right? Right. Great. My next guest knows everything about what's coming up at Northrop Auditorium. He's the director of Northrop, Dale Schatzline. Hi, how are you? Thanks for being here, Dale. Now, as the director of Northrop, um, you get to program with your crew, your cast of uh, staff over there. Um, some fabulous art, and I want to talk about the upcoming season in a moment. But I have to believe that most people watching have certainly heard of Northrop, and anybody that has attended the university, and probably a lot of folks that didn't, know that Northrop Auditorium exists. Could you give us a little background, Dale, about Northrop, its origins, and what it's been doing all these years? Right. Well, the building itself was built in 1929, and uh, the catalyst for it was uh, uh, Mrs. Scott, who was the wife of the uh, music uh, school of music chair, uh, Scott Hall, obviously. Right. And it was her interest in marrying uh, the professional side of what the school was trying to do, in other words, educate students about music. And she decided that she wanted to present some fine uh, musical offerings. And she started in 1919 at the old Armory, which is still in the corner of University and 17th, oh, or Church Street. Sure. And they programmed there for 10 years until she convinced the president that they ought to um, basically build Northrop Auditorium. Uh, in the 20s, after, basically after the First World War, uh, a lot of uh, servicemen were coming back thinking about getting into education. And, and uh, so in the 20s, there was a huge influx of people. The first thing they decided to do with the public money was to build Memorial Stadium. Uh, because mm -hmm. they thought they needed a football team, and that was part okay. of the traditional part of it. And then they thought they needed a concert hall, and so Northrop was finally built in 1929. And Im immediately thereon, uh, the Minnesota Orchestra moved in mm -hmm. the first year and was there until 1974. When so, it moved downtown. 
But, and certainly as a youngster, I remember that's where I first saw orchestral music was Northrop Auditorium. Right. And then right after the Second World War, the Metropolitan Opera started touring. Originally, they started touring by, uh, by train. And they would go to uh, cities and play one or two gigs. But finally, by the 50s and 60s, they ended up with seven cities doing seven performances in these seven cities. And that oh. went through 1985. Right. And that was another great contribution. Because that hall was there, they had a place to do that. And so finally, when the or orchestra moved to Orchestra Hall in 74, Northrop said, well, what, you know, what are we going to do without the orchestra? And that's where we sort of got to the idea of dance. Uh, no one was really doing dance. Uh, we had started a series in 71. We had been presenting dance all along, but in 71, we actually got a fixed series and uh, said, well, we ought to uh, redo the stage with a basket weave floor. Uh, George Balanchine in New York City uh, created this floor, so it's got resiliency to it. And uh, that was put in in 76, and we've been uh, going on our dance series ever since. Yeah, I often think that uh, Northrop is probably the premier dance space in the Twin Cities. There's some other good ones, but that's the one, I guess, if you had, certainly if you had a large company, as you often do. And you focus on the national and the international acts that are available to come to the Twin Cities. That seems to be what makes sense. Uh, obviously, it's a very large room. Um, you know, if you had uh, your perfect world, maybe it wouldn't be quite as large, but that's what we have. And so we've decided to, you know, accommodate what we have and do what we can uh, best with it. And that seems to be large dance companies. You mentioned Cloudgate. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had everybody from American Ballet Theater, New York City Ballet, and Alvin Ailey. Yeah. Uh, we have a great cast this year with uh, Well, maybe with now's activity. the time. Can you just kind of outline the season? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a deep season as I look at your uh, promotional material. Yeah, it's, I tell you what's fun about it is that we don't try to necessarily balance every single season exactly the same. And so we're trying to give it some uh, flavor of, of things that maybe people know, some that they don't know. But this year, I think it's very theatrical. And we open with a piece uh, called Les Enfants Terribles that uh, uh, Jean Cocteau actually wrote a book in the 1920s. And Philip Glass has been uh, kind of interested in Cocteau's work and actually created three full-length pieces of Cocteau's work. This is the third of the trilogy. Uh, the other two were The Beauty and the Beast, or La Belle la Bette, and then Orphée. And this is the third in the series, but he's asked Susan Marshall to do the choreography for it. And Susan has been here a couple times before and has captured, I think, this book uh, very, very well. Uh, we then have uh, the uh, Lyon Opera Ballet, a company from France. Uh, for some reason, we have um, a number of companies from outside of the US this year. And so it becomes very international. You mentioned Cloudgate uh, Theater. Um, uh, we saw the clip on that. Uh, very, very Eastern kind of sensibility. Yes, yes. Uh, time, time is in a different place mm -hmm. because it takes place so slowly. And so what I notice when I go to a performance like that or if I go to Sankai Juku or somebody like that, um, the average Western uh, audience member or theater member is like, at first it's like, oh, it's so slow, I can't. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden you're 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 just you're slowing down, and as you slow down, this piece sort of washes over you. You engage with it at that point, yeah. And then by the time you get done, you're like, "Wow, look at that!" Uh -huh. well, just I was on a journey someplace. Sure. Well, now in a moment we're going to take a look at uh, a company. I may not pronounce this correctly. Carbon Cators. They're that's out of Canada, as it happens. That's right. Can you describe them a little bit? They're uh, they're probably even more theatrically based. Mm -hmm. uh, they're from Montreal. Um, and I think what you find in Montreal is the much more interest in the uh, European tradition of dance and theater. And so uh, I would say it's more a theater company with dance elements to it. And we'll see that on the clip a little bit because it starts, as you noticed, uh, uh, very slowly in terms of the movement. But the premise for the piece, and the piece is called The Dead Souls, is that it's, it's a house it's an interior of a house that somebody has inhabited. In fact, a whole family has inhabited over three generations. And so characters show up from all three generations. Okay. And finally, they end up in this explosion of movement that is, is really the hallmark of the Carbone com Company. They've been here once before. They did a piece called Le de Les Detois, or The Dormitory. And it was very, very exciting and just well, sort of nonstop movement. It and certainly just caught my attention. I'll say, tell you, why don't we go to that clip right now um, and take a look at Carbon Cartors, and we'll come back and talk about that and some of the rest of the things you're doing at Northrop. Okay, Carbon Cartors. <laughs>
Well, it may just be my background, uh, Dale, but I just like the energy there. And as, as you were indicating, it starts off very lyrically, and then it goes into this sort of madcap thing. But it's fair to say, though, that that's obviously just a small clip from a full performance. So there's more than that to see. I thought it was wonderful. Right, absolutely. Yeah, sure. And, and we were talking, too, in the break there that um, uh, there are groups like that, but then you end the season with the Swan Lake, a more classical piece of the repertoire. So. Right. Yeah. Did you want to talk about that at all? Uh, well, just what that company is. Just just to say that uh, that Ben Stevenson, who directs that company, is uh, British um, mm. born, and uh, they. I think the Europeans have a whole sense of the cl classical repertoire that is uh, sort of predates us in a way. I mean. The, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, you know, uh, where ballet really starts, and that whole tradition, which becomes Russian at some point, and then, um, you know, sort of the uh, uh, English uh, component to it, mm -hmm. they really sort of understand that 19th century full-length yes. kind of thing. Whereas I think uh, in the U.S. we're really more modernists in a way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's just a wonderful contrast yeah, of nice styles of, yeah. of dance. Um, my sense is, is that. You have a wonderful job in at least one way. You get to essentially curate um, your season. How do you look at what you do? Where do you go to find these? How, do you, how does your mind work when you say, I've got a, a season to fill? Um, basically, it's, uh, I guess, partially like uh, uh, somebody like uh, Joe Dowling as an artistic director. I mean, he's looking at the literature of theater. We're looking at the literature of dance, and mm -hmm. so we're going to see these things in New York or Los Angeles or Paris or wherever they are, and and we're looking at the critical acclaim of what's happening. Want to get a mix of what's going on, and so we're always trying to, uh, you know, you see a hundred things and you find one that you like, yeah. and so I can't tell you how many countless nights I've spent in theaters, seeing some things that are nothing wrong with them per se, but it doesn't really pick you up out of your mm -hmm. seat and grab you and say, I would, I would go pay money to see this. That's right. And so that's what we're looking for, is the ones that really grab you and say, wow. Yeah, and then you put those together. Um, given your perspective, um, nationally, internationally, any words on the state of dance today? My sense is that dance kind of has its ups and its downs, so both in terms of popular appeal and then what's being created and certainly funding and support. What's your perspective on how the dance scene is? Uh, dance scene, I think, is in transition. And what I mean by that is that um, the, the way it was done 15, 20 years ago is no longer uh, uh, viable. Um, so people are having to think about new ways of doing things. Um, the big companies are going to do OK, especially when they've got uh, grounding, oh, say, say, uh, San Francisco uh, Ballet wonderful support in their home city, uh, touring capabilities, they're doing just fine. And the small companies are also doing fine. They don't have a lot of overhead. Um, they're not paying for big, expensive space. The ones in the middle are the ones that are right now are getting a little bit uh, uh, compacted. And what they're having to do is their artistic directors are having to be creative about how they um, put themselves forward. Uh, Ralph Lemon comes uh, as an example, uh, Twyla Tharp, who no longer has her own company, but just puts a company together for specific projects. So they're having to be creative about how they're able to do things. But in terms of technique, these people are uh, probably the best they've ever been. I mean, wow. we, have, we have hundreds and thousands of really fabulous dancers. And uh, when I look at, say, for example, the program at the university, the dance program at the university, we now have 70 majors there. We're, we're turning out people. In dance. In dance. Wow. And these people are now getting jobs uh, sometimes in the Twin Cities, but a lot of times in New York sure. for, the, for the companies, because right now New York still is the center of, of sort of the modern dance world. And we were chatting, too, that uh, they've just broken ground on a dance facility at the university. That's right. For the dance program there. That's pretty exciting. Dale, I don't want to uh, end this conversation without also talking about some of the other things that go on uh, at Northrop. I know you have popular um, cultural events there as well, but a very important jazz series. What, fifth year now? Fifth year for the Northrop Jazz Series. Um, we had, I've had an interest in jazz the, the whole time I've been there, but we finally have, I think, the right facility to present a series, and that's the Ted Mann Concert Hall, which mm -hmm. is an 1,100-seat hall. And so we've created, again, a fixed series of things where some of it you know, like the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, or uh, the Jazz Messengers, uh, or Chick Corea, Gary Burton. But we also have some things that you might not be as familiar with, like uh, Don Byron uh, Octet is doing a uh, film score for uh, 1920s silent film called The Scar of Shame. And we'll do that at the Walker Art Center 
um, as well as we're doing the Sun Ra Orchestra. Uh, Sun Ra passed away a number of years ago, but his band still uh, maintains. And uh, very quirky, you know, kind of out there. Right. His his new book is called uh, his biography is called Space is the Place, and, uh, and he's there now. <laughs> and he is there now. <laughs> and as you indicate, um, that jazz series, you have at least one of those events, I think, at Northrop itself, but some are at Ted Mann, one or two over at the the, at the Walker Art Center. Right. Um, along those lines, if people wanted to find out more about tickets and venues, both to your dance series, other events, and, and certainly the jazz series, there's a university uh, line that they can call. Dale, what is that number? It's 624-2345. Okay, so folks can give that a call and just get hooked up with dates, times, locations, and stuff like right. that. Right. We've got less than a minute left, uh, Dale. Um, very briefly, what is your relationship with the university? I mean, you're a constituent part of the University of Minnesota? Right. We're actually called the Department of Concerts and Lectures. Okay. Um, more concerts than lectures, frankly, but right. it, we're a self-standing uh, department um, at, at the university. Okay. Well, Dale Schatz, I want to thank you for coming in and previewing the 97-98 season, giving us a little background on Northrop Auditorium. Thanks, Phil. Nice to have you here. Okay. Very much. Well, now, as we go out of this segment, we're going to take another look at uh, a clip of one of the dance companies coming to Northrop Auditorium in this coming season. It's the Georgian State uh, Dance Company. Did I get the name right there? And uh, Dynamic. And uh, I think you'll enjoy this. It hurts my knees to look at that. Y yes. Watch <laughs> the gentleman's knees. I think they go into slow motion at a point here. Um, but it's, it's fabulous dancing. So we'll be right back uh, after that. That looked like a great dance over there, and I think I'm going to go see the uh, Georgian State Dancers at the Northrop Auditorium. I recommend you do it, too. Now, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis officially will open its new facility this fall. Located at the historically significant gateway to Minneapolis, it's a major landmark on the riverfront, anchoring, as it were, the warehouse district. Now, the site features a placemaking plaza, a significant landscape treatment that invites pedestrians down to the river, and new settings for three large works of art, Paul Granlin's Time Being, Charles Perry's Thrice, and Arturus by Dimitri Hadzi. Inside the building is Aldo Moroni's new massive piece depicting the entire 9th Federal Reserve District. Let's go inside and take a look. This is Minneapolis. The Cherry over at the Walker Art Center, the IDS Center, First Bank, AT&T, the Basilica. Then if we move across, this is St. Paul. There's the cathedral and the capital, downtown area. And the river is coming right through in here. In the lobby of the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis is their new building. Uh, and I'm Aldo Moroni and I was commissioned by the Federal Reserve Bank to build this sculpture for the wall. And this wall is uh, about 396 square feet. Uh, and on that wall, we created these ceramic blocks, of which there are 280 that comprise a kind of a map of the Federal Reserve Bank. This is a ceramic sculpture built with Minnesota white stoneware, all fired and glazed. Approximate weight is about 6,000 pounds. It was built in six months by a team of seven different artists in my studio, which is literally across the river. This piece is called This River, This Place, and it's specifically about this location, which is Hennepin and First, and the bank's new home, but also about the way that this location relates to the territories and the provinces that the bank serves, which are specifically the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Northwestern Wisconsin, all of Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and all of Montana. 
all of those regions are disparate in their economies and what they do. Some are foresting, some are mining, some are agriculture, but they're all tied together in an economic community, which is the 9th Federal Reserve District. Federal Reserve Districts, of which there are 12, um, are all separate, and that they do serve that sort of uh, provincial kind of idea that there, for instance, there's one that serves uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. Uh, San Francisco serves the West Coast. Uh, St. Louis serves the Central Midwestern core. We're the Northern Tier States. We have a different economy and a different history and a different reason for being tied together. But the interesting thing in the notion of this river, this place, is the way that Minneapolis and the Minneapolis, um, this specific location, is where all of these goods and services and ideas funnel into as they address the wider world. So that we as individuals are tied together in this economy that addresses the larger international economy and an economy of history. So the research on a piece like this is created um, using a variety of different sources. Um, we used uh, some of them are Landsat photos and Geosat and things like that where we can go into computer programs and pick up specific areas, find out what their uh, road systems, water systems, and rail systems are. Then other kinds of research or pictorial research, what does a town or uh, an area look like? What does a beet field look like? What kind of tractors do they use in southern Minnesota as opposed to um, the kind of tractors that are used up in the far northern plains of uh, Montana and uh, those areas where they have different kinds of agricultural needs. So we combine those kinds of research with also stories so that we, we look at um, the history of Italian-American mining families in the Upper Peninsula, or we talk about Irish immigrants who came to Butte uh, to mine the, the uh, copper mines in Anaconda, to uh, take the copper and gold out of those hills, and what that kind of uh, ethnocentric history might be. Um, we talk about Jewish immigrants in uh, Minneapolis coming in and being involved in the fur trades. So we start to put all those things together, and we get all this information pulled together, and we throw it all away, and then we create a completely new work of art that's based instead of on the concrete literal information, it's based more on a sense of what the feeling, the color, and the texture of those histories are, and that's what makes what what gives the soul to the piece. First person on the project was Paige Winger, but then she got pregnant, and when you're pregnant, you can't work ceramics, so she was immediately gone. Hazardous. Yeah. Right. Terms. And then the next one was Nick Robleski, and uh, these are all people who've been interns or students of mine at different times. Uh, and Nick Robleski is, uh, just had finished his education, um, got his BFA, and uh, was waiting to start an internship in New Mexico, and just flew in and ended up working on the project. And uh, he and Glenn Hansen is over here right now working on um, identifying what goes up on the scaffold next. But they rolled out the slabs, and it, when I say there's 6,000 pounds clay now, is 12,000 pounds wet. So they would push 600 to 1,000 pounds of clay per day uh, in a team of basically three of us in the studio every day. Um, then we went into a second phase where that team kind of left and then Daniel Harris, who's working upstairs right now on the scaffold doing the installation, came in. Uh, we also, Paula Peterson came in and Joan Williams came in. That team of three uh, spent uh, intense amount of time in the detailing and the coloration of the piece. So that what we do is um, we come up to a block into a specific area and I'd say, okay, this is Bemidji. And then I'd take it and I'd sketch it in and I'd give them a parameter. I'd say, okay, this has uh, 25 houses and it has to have 100 trees. And uh, Paul Bunyan goes over here, leave Paul Bunyan for later. And what they do is they'd start to block it in and detail it in. I'd go in and finish out the carving. Then we'd start to do the color, then I'd go and correct the color. So we went through this process, but all of this happened over the course of six months. So we would work back to back, 18 hour days, seven days a week, of which we did that straight for four months. Um, Daniel would sleep upstairs next to the big kiln, I'd sleep downstairs with the little kiln because we have to babysit the kilns at night. Um, and that was the only way to do this job. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks to the City Cable 34 crew for bringing us that wonderful view of the Aldo Moroni sculpture. And now, with me today, I'm very excited to have three gentlemen here. Don Bages, who is Hello. with Windlight Studios. Welcome, Don. Mm -hmm. Ted Fries, here with IVL. And Stan Bissinger, who is uh, the president of Seagraph and also is working at the Art Institute of Minnesota, yep. teaching. We are here to talk about the Minnesota Electronic Theater 8 
But first, I would like to hear just a little bit about um, what each of you do and where you're working. Tell us a little bit about Windlight First Done. Okay. Well, uh, we do computer animation, mm -hmm. uh, character animation, and we're working basically in commercials and uh, somewhat long form mm -hmm. animation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we use, basically, we use motion capture to do all of our basic animation with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ted. Um, IBL, we're calling ourselves really a digital production company. So we do post-production for TV as well as long-form video, uh, music, graphics, and animation, then multimedia as well. So we're kind of calling it all digital assets that we work back and forth with. Mm -hmm. Stan, new school. Yes. Well, a, as an instructor, I, I, I tend to work with students at the very beginning of their experience in 3D. And so it's kind of fun because I can hopefully get, the, uh, get them going on the right path. Mm -hmm. Uh, working with a uh, 3D package uh, on NT, as well as uh, a very nice paint package using uh, the graphic pens and so forth, so they get both the art side and the 3D and modeling side of it. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about SeaGraph. What is SeaGraph? Well, SeaGraph <laughs> is, technically speaking, is part of ACM, which is the, uh, the uh, Association of Computer Machinery. And it's, I think, one of the larger of the subgroups or, or SIGs, mm -hmm. uh, special interest groups for, for of ACM, mm -hmm. and it's concentrated on computer or on on, anim, or on graphics. Mm -hmm. I should say it's not just animation, although it seems to go a lot towards animation, but mm -hmm. print graphics, any area of graphics, and they're uh, they're basically an educational body which produce a lot of literature mm -hmm. on the technology and on the where where it's at and. What SIGGRAPH has been nationally is a sort of a benchmark for what this industry is doing on a year-by-year -year basis. It sort of defines the cutting edge, and that's what we kind of like to do here in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. They just had the national convention out in L.A.? Yes, in L.A. 45,000, did I read? Well, it's attendance? easier to get big numbers in L.A. That's, that's, the, uh, <laughs> yes. that's, the, that's the mecca. Mm -hmm. Last year it was in New Orleans. I was there last year. I didn't get a chance to make it this year. Mm -hmm. But there was only 26,000, mm -hmm. I think. But you see, we, we, they, they, they actually say a L.A. SIGGRAPH versus a non-L.A. SIGGRAPH. Right. So right. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Well, um, we have been doing the Minnesota Electronic Theater here in Minneapolis for, this will be our eighth year. It started out, I think, when we just kind of got together with a few of the uh, local post-production houses and animation companies, uh, and we wanted to have an opportunity to bring the work and show it to the people in the city and show how talented <laughs> we are here in Minneapolis. Um, and it had grown throughout the years. We usually get about 600 people at the show every year. But this year, we decided to do something a little bit different. And um, instead of having it by invitation, the exhibitors by invitation, um, we're now going to have a juried show, which means that anyone who's out there doing computer animation or manipulating uh, live action or whatever they're doing on the com computer, if it moves, they have an opportunity to show their work at the Minnesota Electronic Theater. Stan, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how and why we decided to change the <coughs> format. Sure, leave it for me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, there has been a huge amount of interest in this area uh, because of the film and video aspect of it. We see it in almost every film and every video now. There seems to be a huge computer component to it. Even if it's something very obvious, and I'll go back a few years, like a mask type, type movie with lots of 3D, or something that isn't very obvious, such as Forrest Gump, where the novice could look at that and never even detect that there's any manipulation on a computer at all. But regardless, one way or the other, as far as the Minneapolis scene is concerned, uh, I think we were trying to respond to the, wide, the wider range of people interested in getting into this industry and showing their work. Mm -hmm. And the other phenomena within the computer industry has been that the systems that you, know, you needed to do animation used to be a quarter of a million dollars or $150,000. And now mm -hmm. uh, you can purchase a relatively medium-sized computer and still execute relatively uh, good quality animation, and so we wanted to reflect the sort of the surgence of uh, creativity amongst a lot of individuals in this in this area, and mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to say, "This is what we're doing." Mm -hmm. And I was obviously one of the concerns was that the people that have been doing it wanted to keep a very high level of quality to mm -hmm. the show, and we're still going to be doing that, I think, with mm -hmm. the juring. 
But uh, it's, for the same time, I think some of the individuals that are on this and have been doing it, they're looking forward to seeing what's out there, kind some of a, a way of you know reviewing the good talent that's coming up through the through the cracks, so to speak. We're looking for the gems out there that we haven't <laughs> had an opportunity to see before. The cream that rises to the top. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that people have. Uh, uh, it gives everybody an advantage or something to go for in trying mm -hmm. to get right. stuff out there. That's that's great. Mm -hmm. And I think that the surprising thing is that people that are working by themselves come out with great things yeah. and, and mm -hmm. surprise everybody in yeah. new directions yeah. and everything. So that's great. Don, you've been you've been uh, participating and been at the show over a number of years. What are your impressions of the electronic theater? What's good about it? What's special about it? Well, I think the thing that hits me first when you go in there is that everybody's there. Yeah. You know, and, and it's so wonderful to just come in, you're shaking hands with all these people, <laughs> and yeah. the stuff's all running there, and, yeah. it's, and it feels like, wow, this is our little Hollywood sort mm -hmm. of sitting here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a neat thing. It's uh, uh, a really warm thing. Everybody's mm -hmm. very friendly. And, yeah. and uh, so I think it's that kind of thing that helps all of the studios uh, get grow mm -hmm. a, and also to uh, y you feel more secure in asking people to come into the city to sure. work here because you know there is a community growing here mm -hmm. and that's one of the big things that, that makes it very difficult for studios they, they end up they have to bring people in and then there is no place for those people to go if anything starts to go bad if, you, if the work starts to dry up or whatever mm -hmm. there, there's no freelance thing there's nothing like that's happening which is something we have to build here, and this is that's a, this is a good start in, mm -hmm. in doing that kind mm -hmm. of thing too. Mm -hmm. Ted, what um, over the years you've seen a number of shows? What's your what are your what's your impression of this? How can, how would you describe it to somebody who's never been there? You know, I think it's been a great chance, certainly for us, and this is coming from the post side, to really see, as Don was saying, other people, but other work from other other mm -hmm. companies in the industry. I mean, we tend to get so cloistered in the projects that we're doing for our clients. It's just really nice to see mm -hmm. other projects and other work. I mean, mm -hmm. not certainly from competitive, but just it's nice to see other creative. I think we all just build upon that front we see it too. Yeah, that's right. a sense that I've gotten too from, from everybody that's participated participated in the past. It's just, you guys don't get a chance to see each yeah. other. No, and I think what happens in, uh, in things too is that you're, you're working, you're, you've developed to a certain point, and, uh, and then a client comes in with a thing that you've never done before, right, right. <laughs> and you have to jump and mm -hmm. go to that next point, and it's those things that people start seeing when we get to that show that you're mm -hmm. seeing all the advancements that everyone's making, right. you know, mm -hmm. and you just, wow, it's just really wonderful right. to see what's happening, and you're always being forced by your client to, to get better at, mm -hmm. at things, and so. Yeah, it's a small community too, which is really nice. As Don said, yeah. you go in and you you know everybody, and you're shaking hands, and it's, so mm -hmm. it's really nice as far as that goes. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that support, which I think this town is we're fortunate to have that yeah. too, versus a lot of others. One of the things we're trying to do with this show too is to open it up to those folks who are doing a more interactive multimedia, which IVL right. is doing a lot of. Right. Um, how does what do you think we might be seeing from that side of the business this time around? Well, you know, we're finding that, um, I mean, interactive and multimedia is really just an extension of what we've done on along with designing for graphics and animation. And it's just finding our clients just, they're using that as another tool to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, so we're finding that we're having to use, whether it's logos or animations, to design it, whether it's for TV or video, also go it, uh, to make it um, go to the website if mm -hmm. they have one, or an intranet site, or a kiosk. So we're having to really plan it further along and really try to ask even more questions. Well, what's your intent when you're doing this? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty slick, actually. I mean, it's just one other vehicle right. for our clients to use. Right, right, right. Which is really nice. Yeah. And that whole thing's expanding. There's always something new, new exactly. way of demonstrating right. it. Which is a yeah. challenge, too, of yeah. course, with anything. I mean, nothing is, it's not in stasis or anything. I mean, it's always evolving and changing, so that's really the challenge mm -hmm. for us, mm -hmm. is yeah. to try to figure out, well, what's the best way? You know, there are many paths we can go to do something, mm -hmm. but trying to figure out the best way mm -hmm. and for the parameters. So it's cool. I mean, it's a real challenge. Yeah. Don, you've been in the business for a while here. Yes. Um, I'm just curious, as as to someone who's coming into the into the business now, a young person that might be interested in doing this. Um, from your perspective, uh, what are the skills that are kind of timeless that they need to bring into being a good computer animator? That mm. maybe you've seen through all these years that those kind of skills that still play out from doing the cell animation to what we're doing now. Well, one of the things that surprised me about computer animation is that, um, and which makes this a difficult question, yeah, to answer, I know. because uh, 
traditional animators draw things, it takes days, weeks to do the drawings, and then we shoot a pencil test of the thing, and then you look at that, and, and then you try to figure out what's wrong with it, and you go back and you make corrections, and then you shoot another pencil test, and so this is weeks of work. Right. And, in, and so a person working and developing their technique, it takes years to do that. And you're always taking so long to, to get things around to a point to be able to make the next move up. Whereas in the computer stuff, you're sitting there and you, you, you do some stuff and you do a playback right there and you look <laughs> at it and you go, gosh, that isn't working. And I can make this change here. Uh -huh. and, this. and so I think animators are developed in a year or two. And, and in traditional animation, we always said, you know, people need five to 10 years to become a good animator. Mm -hmm. And 15 to 20 to really be good. Right. And, uh, and so, and there's other people who'd say 75 years to be really good. <laughs> and, and that's probably true because uh -huh. there's just so much to learn you can and you still can't do it. Yep. learn it in that time. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But when you're sitting with a computer, it's doing all of these things that take so much time. Mm -hmm. It's doing them all for you. You can go in and look at it and say, uh, well, I think the one thing that, that is needed for students is uh, anybody coming in is to realize that the computer is just a box. Right. And, uh, and you have to think outside of that, and you have to tell it, I don't like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and I want you to make this happen faster, and I want that slower, and it doesn't want to do those things because right. everything is supposed to be perfect. Yeah. And uh, so uh, you, gotta, you have to go in and make it unperfect and, and make it happen with feeling and, and do mm -hmm. all those things, and the computer does not, you know, it's sitting around going, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what is this thing yeah. that's happening to me? I'm all of a sudden caring about this move. <laughs> I'm not supposed to care. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah. That's, I think that's the, the big thing, to just mm -hmm. recognize that, you know, this is just a tool. Mm -hmm. So to try and learn as much as you can mm -hmm. outside of, of just working with the, the computer, mm -hmm. looking and seeing what other cartoons are doing, what other animators are doing, uh, um, mm -hmm. even studying traditional animation just mm -hmm. to get a feeling of it and know how things right. are move. And yeah. So and come to the Minnesota Electronic Theater. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. right. Yeah, well, there it's all happening. I didn't plan right that there. segue, but it well, worked kind of nicely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to give our viewers just a few details about the Electronic Theater. The event actually doesn't happen until November 5th, but the okay. call for entries, here it is, very exciting. Call for entries is being mailed uh, tomorrow. So it'll be coming to everybody, you know, everybody's doorstep or mailbox. Very shortly, if you don't get one in the mail and you're in the business, or even if you're not and you're working on a computer and have something that you're interested in entering, um, you can call my office phone number, which is 673-2947. I will send you a call for entries. What we're looking for primarily, um, entries must be created in Minnesota by Minnesota artists. Uh, the work should have been produced or released after January 1st, 1994. And any work generated or manipulated by computer is eligible for consideration. Still photographs and still computer images are not eligible, however. So it's going to be a good show. I'm really excited. I'm pleased that this group got together and decided to open it up. And then it's happening. And Thank so we'll have a, a good, uh, good show again this year. Thanks, Thank you all for coming here. Uh, to talk a little bit about it. Appreciate your time. Don, we're going to show some work from Windlight Studios as we, okay. as we go out here. If you want to tell us a little bit about what we're going to see. Well, uh, the first piece is uh, a pilot piece we did called Weldon Pond. And that one is showing a motion capture uh, sequence and then it shows the animated sequence after that. And that was one of our early motion capture mm -hmm. pieces where we were still in the bottom part of writing the software for wow. it. And then the next thing is a, a, a bit with Barbie doing a ballerina dance routine. Mm -hmm. And that was still early in, in the process. And, and you can feel when you see it, to comparing it to the next piece, which is Rapunzel, after that, uh, you'll see the, the freedom of movement. There's much more softness and everything happening, both in the, the visual, the character, and, and mm -hmm. also in the movement. And then the last piece is the thing, Tootsie Pops. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's three characters, and, and at this point now we're doing three characters, where before we were struggling to do just one, mm -hmm. and now we're struggling to do three, but at least we got three. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's great, because in this case we had to, because they were all in sync with each other so much mm -hmm. that you couldn't record one and then record another, another one. They just, sure. So Amazing. we did it. Yeah. And that's one of those things where a client wants this kind of look, and you, you make figure out how to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're going to so. see a, a nice progression. 
yeah. of how the how the technology and the industry has changed. Yeah, and that's in just over a short time. three years. Yeah. 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 Thanks again for coming. Appreciate yeah. it very much. Um, after the clip of Windlight's work, uh, Phil will be back with his guests Stuart Rosen and Amy Parks from the Ice Age Theater. And in case you just joined us, you're watching Artifacts, the show that brings the arts in Minneapolis home to you. Oh, don't forget, if you're the seventh caller to leave your name, number, and address on the City Cable 34 hotline, you'll be the proud owner of that stunning hat from the Minnesota Film Board. So call 673-2234 now, and you could be the big winner. And here's the clip from Windlight Studios. Jennifer! Oh! Here, smell this. No, thank you. Come on! I just bathed in something expensive. I didn't roll with anything bad, if that's what you're worried about. I know you didn't, because you're too fat to get back up on your hind legs. I'm not fat. I have a knee injury. Uh-huh. She digs me. <laughs> hey, Jennifer, come here. Smell this. No, thank you. Come on, I just bathed in something expensive. I didn't roll in anything bad, if that's what you're worried about. No, you didn't, because you're too fat to get back up on your hind legs. I'm not fat. I have a knee injury. Uh-huh. She digs me. upon a time in a far away land lived a girl with the longest most beautiful hair ever her name was Rapunzel she was forced to remain in the tower until her one true love found her Rapunzel Rapunzel let down your hair so that I may climb the golden stair it was true the spell was broken, and Rapunzel was free, and they lived happily ever after. They'll eat your home! They'll eat your homework! They'll eat your... Excuse me. Yes? Can you tell me how many licks to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Perhaps. Why? At the center of every Tootsie Pop, there's a chocolatey, chewy Tootsie Roll. Begin the count. One, two, two. You bet. You bet. Allow me. One, two. How many licks to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Three. The world may never know. We bet. We bet. Well, now, if you like that, you can see a lot more exciting video and animation like that at the Electronic Theater coming up later this fall down at the Fine Line. Minneapolis Warehouse District. Well, my next guests are involved with a new show that's opening up next month at the Ice Age Theater. Stuart Rosen, welcome to the show. It's nice Thank to you. have you here. And Amy Parks, Hi. you'll be acting in that show, yes, I understand I it. Yes. And the name of it, it's kind of a grabber, Crossbones. Stuart, do you want to give us a little background on the show that you're producing? Sure. Uh, Crossbones is a story of uh, a soldier in war, um, maybe our next war, who's uh, faced with a, something of a life and death dilemma and he can't figure out what to do and so the ghosts of some of his ancestors show up uh, to give him some advice and to try to persuade him to do what they think he should do. Sounds like an interesting premise. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, inspired this? Well, uh, some years ago, about 15 years ago, was when I first started developing the show and actually it's the only play I've written where it started with an issue. I wanted to write a show about war. Um, usually I have an idea for a story first and that leads to the development of it. And uh, just playing around with different ideas about what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. And the ghost showed up one day and other characters and other issues and the story developed. Sounds like it could be kind of serious, kind of heavy. Yeah, it's a fairly serious show. There is some humor in it, mm -hmm. um, uh, except for the central character whom the ghosts are visiting. None of the other living people in the, uh, in the show can see or hear the ghosts. So there's a little humor around that. You know, mm -hmm. they can say and do things that the audience can see, but other people can't. Does, and, does this come out of any personal background? I mean, have you had war experience yourself other than the not, main streets? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. It's just, you know, looking at and being a part of a society and, and in fact being part of the whole world these days where you can't avoid war and 
what it does and you know what it doesn't mm -hmm. and just uh, you know wanting to deal with that on a real human scale you know the issues of course are big but it's really about the, the characters in the play the living people in the play and the ghosts in the play and the choices they make around okay. around this large cast eight. eight which is fairly large these days yeah I would think yeah and Amy, you were one of them mm -hmm. in that show. Now, you have an interesting character. Uh, we were talking a little bit before we sat yes. down. You actually, uh, I'm not sure it's on stage, but you command people, or you have been a commander? Oh, he's sergeant in the oh, military. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have a little rank up there. That's right, but, but you definitely. get to keep your hair in this production. I'm keeping the hair, I'm sorry. We're That's keeping right. the hair, That's it. No G.I. Jane here, no way. Um, your background as an actor here in town? Yeah, mm -hmm. I got my Bachelor of Fine Arts from University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, that was about four years ago. Just been working pretty consistently throughout town, doing live theater, doing right. you know commercial industrial work. Lived in Los Angeles for a little while. Did that. Did the LA thing? Yeah, came yeah. back to my roots. I needed to get back to some real acting. <laughs> okay. No, that's interesting. I want to <laughs> mm, talk about that a little bit. When you say real acting, as opposed to what commercial stuff that you're finding out there, or what? Um, what was the difference? The I think the quality of acting out there was everyone's out there to do a showcase and to be to be seen and to be found and discovered, and when I came back here it was actually getting down to character analysis to really learning and to really you know getting down to the nitty gritty of and it's not all about I'm going to be a star and someone's going to discover me here. So it sounds like the roles so. that they're trying out for there is really a means to an end. They're hoping that basically this, yeah. somebody will see them in whereas here yeah. a little more focus on the show on the yeah. script on. It's, the story, as yeah, we were saying. Exactly. It's Correct. much more satisfying. Now, what attracted um, you to this particular piece? I, um, how'd you hear about it? Well, uh, the paper. Okay. Um, I'd heard of Ice Edge Theater before and um, really wanted to work at the theater garage, you know? As a physical space. Yeah, exactly. What, what attracts you to the theater garage? Um, I just, it's a very open space, a yeah. um, lot of seating. The setting, and it can be, I wasn't sure exactly what he was going to do, like proscenium thrust mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, or you could do it in the round there. And it, I happen know. to like that space myself as it's an just, audience yeah. goer. Yeah. It's a comfortable space to very see theater in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little coffee right too. up the alley there. Mm -hmm. Nobody's very exactly. far away from the action either. Yes, yeah. yes. Now does that, because of the configuration there, which I would describe as sort of long and not terribly deep, right. does that pose a challenge to you as a director? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, it has... It has um, some very good qualities that it offers mm -hmm. because of the intimacy and because of the spread, you can really use the space, but y you have to see it for what it is and use it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly for the set and lighting designers, it's a challenge because it is not a typical theater space, and if you know how to use it well, which the people working with us do, then you can do some very exciting things with it. Okay, well that's great. Let's talk briefly about Ice Age Theater. That's kind of a chilling title here in the <laughs> land of 10,000 frozen ice ponds. Where, what's the name, where does the name come from? Well, um, it's not about our last winter, even though some <laughs> people thought it was. Um, for me, the the, the, the root idea of what theater is for me is people who are excited about stories and want to share them with other people so they're excited also. And the image I have of where that all began is our primitive ancestors around a fire, you know, at the end of a day of hunting and gathering, um, needing to communicate, excited to communicate, and language being you know, limited now and certainly more limited then, there's this natural tendency to act things out. You know, this is me, this is the bear who came out of the woods, you know, this is the deer I was hunting. And you begin to act that out and of course the audiences enjoy that. And, and you know, that I, I believe is the core and that's the image I wanted to evoke. Okay. Is that that's basically what's, what the theater is about for me. Sure, so really getting back to some origins that you're talking about. Reminds me a little bit of the story Bain Belke talks about, the jungle theater. Mm -hmm. some, some real visceral kind of subjective right. kind of spirit to right. what, what theater comes out of. Now we don't do our plays in furs and you know, <laughs> carrying you didn't know clubs. about that part stone of stone gloves or something. Sorry. But 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 that image is a really important one to me because yeah. that's that's what it's about is telling stories, is right. acting out stories. Well, this makes sense because what you're saying is that, that that's the uh, the underpinning of where you're coming from with your storytelling. Now you've written this; you're also directing mm -hmm. this. Is that difficult to do to direct something? that you've written or does that make it easier because you know what the writer meant? Um, mm -hmm. For me, I, I wouldn't say difficult, um, but there are certain challenges in it. There are certain pitfalls you really have to avoid. Um, it, the easy part or the easier part is that because I knew what I was after and I envisioned a whole lot of it as I was writing it, then th that, that work flows right into the rehearsal process. But 
as, as the writer, there's a whole lot of things you want to put into a script, into a show, that, you know, because you don't want to trumpet them in so many words, you sort of want to weave them in. Well, sometimes those aren't so obvious. But if you're directing the show, you might not see that. So in other words, I could think there's some important, subtle element that's there because I wanted it to be there when I wrote yes. it. But I may not be able to see that as we're developing the show in rehearsal, it's not there. I may not know that. Whereas an outside director coming in would be clearer uh, or could be clearer. Mm -hmm. So for me, because I've always pursued acting and, I mean, directing and writing together, you know, to write my stories and then realize them on stage, I've worked hard to to make sure I don't fall into that trap. Well, great. Uh, Amy, you mentioned Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and sort of the cliche out there is that every actor wants to direct. Do you have a similar <laughs> desire five years down the road or anything? No, not, not no. at all. I, I don't have any desire to direct right now. Right now, I want to be on stage. <laughs> That's I want the part to be, you like. Yeah, I yeah. do. It's the whole process of you know, discovering the character and you, you, know, you make up your history and just the whole development that you go through. Once you get into costume, you get into makeup, you get on stage. Mm -hmm. It just it's amazing how it comes alive, and it's very exciting. We've got just a minute left, and I want to ask you an actor-type question. Okay. Um, I think, Stuart, you said eight actors in this. Had you worked with any of those other seven before? No, maybe? not at all. How difficult is that? I know that's the stuff of theater. You yeah. come in, and you don't know where these folks are from. How tricky is that, briefly? I mean, um, At first, yeah, it's, it, get, it can be tricky because you're getting to know each other's niches and how each other works and how dedicated they're going to be to you know getting this play on and doing it. So it's just it's just getting to know each other over and over, and it's, that's the whole what's part of the whole rehearsal process. It keeps you fresh, I suppose. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And yeah, it's, it's good to meet new people and work with new faces. So yeah. it's, it's actually a quite a small theater community here, okay. so it's fun to get to know people and work with them. Stuart, um, if people want to find out more about it, opens October 17th at the Theater Garage. First of all, where is the Theater Garage? The Theater Garage is in South Minneapolis on the corner of Franklin Avenue and Lindale. Okay, so South Minneapolis. Um, phone number for people to call for information tickets? 822-9090. Sounds good. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. Amy, pleasure to meet you. You too. Stuart, to okay. see you. Good luck. Thank you. Break many legs. <laughs> Now, a new movie will start shooting in the Twin Cities in September. Janet will be back with a scoop on that, and I'll bring you some worthy news of note as well when we wrap up this edition after this art quote. Stay tuned. And we're back uh, after a nice show of Artifacts. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got some big news about a movie yes. that's here in town. We have a movie yes. shooting in the Twin Cities. The Naked Man is the name of the film. Mm -hmm. It was written by Ethan Cohen mm -hmm. of the infamous Cohen Brothers and J. Todd Anderson. J. Todd Anderson is directing. They start shooting in September, and we're so glad to have them here. That's Very exciting. Great. Is yep. there an actual Naked Man? Um, I'm not telling. Oh, okay. Somehow I, <laughs> I went immediately to Tom Arnold, and that was a very scary <laughs> Different deal. horror kind of thing. By the way, next month on Artifacts, I'm really excited. We're going to have Tom Langley and Jim Winbloom on the show. They lead uh, tours of downtown Minneapolis mm -hmm. about the historic theaters that were down here, going back to the turn of the century. They're going to be they're fascinating guys to have on the show. Characters. They are said. characters, yes. yes, they are. So tune in. Watch mm -hmm. those guys. Mm -hmm. MC Gallery is next. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Nice looking show coming up at the MC Gallery down in the Warehouse District. Uh, it's a show, a one-woman show, Carol Warner. And what I liked about it, and I don't know why this jogged my memory, but it's a one-woman exhibition of futuristic artifacts. So it opens September 6th, runs through October 11th. And Artifacts viewers. Artifacts should, should go it, see this show, but it has nothing to do. She will deny all, all uh, relationship to this show. And the Ethnic Dance Theater is also having a fun event September 20th. It's their Autumn Colors Dance Party. It's up at the Latvian Hall on Central Avenue Northeast. I've been to some of their events over the years. The, the mm -hmm. choir, the music, the dancing, it's great. Go see it. That sounds good. Yep. I want to mention, too, a little project that yours truly is involved in. Uh, it's a group called Hole in the Sky Network. It's a, we really have a lot of fun. We do original music. Mm -hmm. We got some singing. We got some dancing. It's going to be happening okay. um, at the Bryant Lake Bowl. 
every Sunday in September we're going to be performing. Um, that's the 7th, 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th at 7.30 at the Bryant Lake Bowl. Hole in the Sky Network presents Come Back to Your Senses. And Phil, you really should attend. I, I think I've been assigned. I think I'll be yes. up there. I have seen her I have seen her sing, actually, with a gospel choir yes. once. But mm -hmm. she does this kind of stuff, so go see that. That sounds good. Brian it's going to be well. really fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to thank you for uh, watching Artifacts. Stay tuned. We've got the Artifacts calendar. And don't forget, if you want to win this magnificent prize from the Minnesota Film Board, call the City Cable 34 hotline, 673-2234. Yes, you can look <laughs> this good. Imagine. <laughs> That's right. We'll see you next time on Artifacts. I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janet Zahn. Thanks for watching.